You have been warned. This is our ladies' night dice tower. I've got eight random questions okay. here, and I roll the die three times, and whatever we get, that's where we start at least. And so I guess this is my version of blind rolling. Like, you have to trust me that I'm not cheating and picking a different question. It's true. It's true. But you know what? Trustful. Let's go. If you were living in the Star Wars universe, what role would you want to fill? You know, Jedi, Sith, Empire, running a cantina somewhere. Once you've played somebody in the galaxy and she lives within you, it's very hard to think that you could possibly be anything else. Um, because I very specifically, uh, well, she's kind of got two lot. Okay, this is a, this is a sort of weird and this is the weird answer. Gosh, your editor's gonna have to cut this down because Iden Versio, the character that I play in the Star Wars galaxy, has a bit of both sides: the dark side and the light side. Um, I'll tell you this: I really enjoy when I do have her thoughts. Still, I enjoy. Um, really thinking about what her, the, what working for the empire is like. So um, <laughs> my allegiance, if you will, is still to our Lord Vader. <laughs> In terms of Aiden's life, she learned a lot of really beautiful skills and has a lot of pride in her exactness and all the things that she derived from her family's focus. So even when she becomes a rebel, I, we haven't seen any of this, but like in my heart and mind, she has a whole life where she's really annoyed by the fact that she had to be a rebel for the rest of her life because my gosh, they're messy. Seven is movie and TV skills. If you could learn a new skill or about a different profession through a role, what would you want it to be and why? Okay, my creative partner's name is Russo. You're gonna hear his name a few times. So Russo just told me this thing. He texted me and was like, did you know that Daniel Day-Lewis became such a good boxer that he, he, he like qualified to be a, just a, a professional boxer or something because he beat so many professional boxers in his training. Somebody please fact check this, please, because maybe he was just trolling me to make me feel bad about my own aptitude. So anybody who's watching, if you could just uh, write into the show, that'd be great. Hi, low. Can you give me one audition high and one audition low? If there are any people who are actors or who want to be actors, this is something you'll, you either know or you will learn. Um, some of the best work you do is in the auditions for parts you'll never get because they went to somebody more famous or somebody who, all of the things, right? It has nothing to do with you. And your job is to just leave it on the table no matter what. And I, I screen tested for a pretty amazing project of, across from somebody pretty incredible that I was just honored to be in the same room as. And, uh, it was just one of those magical moments where you just step outside of yourself and feel somebody else's life. And then I didn't get it. But the fact is that, that still, it was like being Icarus. You just fly really close to the sun. And even though nobody is really gonna get to see it, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. So that's a high. And then lows. Uh, so I auditioned for a film that came and went. I mean, even if I, it just felt like it was going to be such a big deal to me. I don't know why I put so much pressure on it. And I knew the director, I had worked with him uh, as an actor a million years ago, but I, ha I don't know. I think I was just having a major, uh, like brain badness, anxiety day or something. I just could not quell the, the gerbils in the brain. And I came in and I just was like so obsessed with the haircut that I wanted for this character that I just kept talking about the haircut and I could not actually focus on who the work the actual character like no character is just a haircut and I'm one of the first people to say that so I just I don't know I just kept like to the point where I think about it even now and I think in the shower like why couldn't I stop talking about the hairstyle it was actually like uh I don't even know what it's called, but Liberty Spikes or something. I just wanted to shave all of this and just have like punk Liberty Spikes. And I was so obsessed with it. It's all I could see in my brain for her. I just couldn't shut up. Uh, so there's that. <sighs>
Would you rather have to fake sneeze or fake vomit in a scene? Fake sneeze. Easy. Can you do a convincing fake sneeze? <laughs> oh, sorry. All right. Yeah. Yeah, you pulled the it thing off. Is I, that always, it's like, I always thought that vomit was gross, but then I thought fake sneezing is incredibly difficult to make. Try to do a fake vomit right now. It makes you actually want to yeah. vomit. It's a terrible place to have to go. Yeah, I, I don't think I would want either because I would suck at both of them. Would you rather have to run a lot in a scene or eat a lot in a scene? Do you have to actually eat? You can have the spit bucket option if you want. No, eat then. If I gotta, if I can spit, then fine. Now I just made it too easy. Yeah, I know. You gave you give me a caveat and I took it. <laughs> right I was like, out. where's the loophole? Where's the loophole? I know what I want you to pick for this one. I'm curious if you do. You're in a you're in a spy movie. Would you rather play a James Bond type character or an Austin Powers type character? <laughs> Austin Powers. Yeah, <laughs> thousand percent. Because the thing is that he thinks he's in a James Bond movie. Right? So you get to play both. <laughs> yes, that is the right approach to that question. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Collider Ladies Night. I'm so happy to have Janina Gavankar on the show. We get to talk about so many of the cool projects you've worked on over the years, but this is in celebration of Big Sky Season 2. And you are something else in it. You own that role. Thanks, dude. What is the movie, the performance, the personal experience, you name it, that first made you say, I have to be an actor? I was Maria in West Side Story, every brown girl's dream. And I was in a rehearsal and I reached out to the guy playing Tony. I didn't even particularly like him, but I felt my heart break into a million pieces. Real heartbreak. I was 16. What the hell did I know about heartbreak? But I felt somebody else. I felt her life. And I was so far from wanting to be an actor at that point. I was a very serious musician and it rocked me. When did the thought process switch from, you know, I'm enjoying doing this for fun and my focus is on music to I need to commit and make this my career? So I did that, I did that musical. I had that moment. I sort of told my mom, I really think I might want to try this. And um, that summer, this was between my junior and senior year of high school, I auditioned for a drum corps called Phantom Regiment. But I also got into a summer semester at Yale. It was like an intensive with their undergrad department, their drama department. So I, I took that opportunity because I was like, I can march next year. And then I never marched. And I only, and I, that was the moment. I got my butt kicked at Yale. And then I came back and I was like, yeah, that feels right. How did, I guess, barbershop come along? Is that the kind of situation where you were just like on the audition grind and that thing kind of hit? Yeah, you know, when you're in Chicago or any second market, as it as they're called, you just kind of are at the mercy of whatever comes to town. And Barbershop was a really big moment for us in Chicago. It was pretty big deal. We were all the locals who got to say precisely one line, or in my case, two words. And um, But the really wonderful thing about that was that I met Michael Ely. The two words that I said... Hi, Ricky, I said to Michael, and we became friends, and that was 20 years ago almost. Is that 20? No, it's like 18. Oh, God. It's a long time ago. Um, and yeah, look it up. Look it up. And, you know, my, he, became, he was the only person I knew when I moved to LA. He picked me up from the airport. That makes me so happy. It's like this <laughs> most wonderful thing. His wife is one of my best friends. It's just, you know, you just, you just think like, wow, it's such a, such a big career moment. I get to be in a real movie and you don't realize that you're, you're going to meet somebody that you might potentially know forever. Given again, how amazing a lot of these collaborations and how a lot of them have sparked long lasting friendships. 
What do you do when you hit the set and a collaborator, whether it was was like a showrunner or a co-star, doesn't meet your expectations for how you like to work with someone? What do you do to try to change that or to make the most of it? There are so many options. The first thing you have to remember is that everything is temporary. So even the longest lasting production is going to be a decade of your life and then you're done. And if you're making it to a decade, you're making so much money, shut up and go cry in your mansion. Okay? So that's one. Have a little perspective. (laughs) Number two, if it's somebody that's just like not really down to play. um, I mean, I've done a few different things. (laughs) I've, um, you know, you still have to do your job. My favorite theater teacher in uh, theater school is this Bulgarian actor named Yasin Payenkov. He's like part of the Steppenwolf company. It's awesome. I got to watch him in shows when I was in theater school. And the thing he said to me was like, not to me. <laughs> Tells you who I was in theater school. I'm like, everything is being said straight into my brain. Uh, but he, you know, one of the things he said in class was some days you feel it, sometimes you don't still got to do your job. Um, but if somebody is specifically being an asshole to the crew, specifically, uh, I have a thing I have done in the past as a guest star on somebody else's show is on my coverage, which means the camera's on you. I'm telling you all the bad stuff now, uh, on my coverage, which means the camera's on you and it's over their shoulder while they're being a baby is as soon as they say, uh, set sounds speeding, which means they're rolling. I look right down the barrel to all of the people at home in the studio. And I just do this because they need to know that something's wrong (laughs) and they should check in on this production. I don't have to say anything. It's just important that they know that there's maybe one bad apple in the bunch. You say doing bad stuff, but I'm okay with that bad stuff if it comes with a good purpose. And that most certainly yeah, does. Yeah, because it takes a hundred people to get through the day. And, and um, you know, again, there's just, we're in an era where you can't get away with it forever. And I want to be a part of that change. All right, Big Sky, how do you go on to score a role like Ren? Is it a situation where they come to you with an audition or an offer, or are you aware of Big Sky and kind of seeking it out? This was an offer, and um, Elwood, the showrunner, wanted to get on the Zoom and chat. And it was happening pretty quickly, so I sat here on in the same place I am right now with you on this same exact laptop, and he talked to me about her but the funny thing she was like i know you're gonna ask me like who is she like you're gonna ask me about this character but the truth is like i don't really know my process is i like to find actors and i like to collaborate with them and i like to write with, for them and i was like mm-hmm. <laughs> you're not speaking my language sir so uh he told me that she came from a crime family i suddenly saw the opportunity to work with actors that are friends of mine and uh have a a group of brown people that were just terrible people. And that is something that we don't get to do often. And that was very exciting to me. <laughs> so was there any particular scene throughout the uh, the first eight episodes that you got to play around with the most or workshop the most? Anytime you see Ryan Onan, who plays Dono, um, he is also a writer producer on the show. So he and I are changing a lot often. Um, we, <laughs> you never really know how much you're going to get away with, but the first thing that we shot together was this, this thing in the car. My first episode is the second episode. Tanya's in the back. I'm like, we, there are no lines in the, there's no lines in the scene. And I look at him and I just kind of like motion to my seatbelt, like put your seatbelt on. And he said, it's itchy on my neck. I, and they kept it in the episode. I was like, oh, you Y'all, if you're going to just let us say things and you're going to keep it in the episode, we're just going to do that forever. So I think my favorite thing that stayed was 
pretty recent. So I stab a guy in the back. He goes down. And then we kind of look at each other. And then I go, you thirsty? And he goes, maybe some milk. And then I just go and fight him. It's not on the page. We just kind of did it. Uh, so th- that's basically it. Anytime you see the two of us in a scene together, we're pretty much making it up. <laughs> adding things. I should say adding things. All very memorable moments. When I started that question, my mind immediately went to the scene with you, you, Jenny, and Poppernack in the trailer in episode seven, and you are just like on fire in that scene. I haven't even seen it yet. I haven't even seen it yet, but that was that was our, this last week, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to very, watch it. Very, very oh, yeah. Good they scene. let me change that too. They, they let me change a. Well, a thing that happens that's kind of funny is that. The thing about working in television is that the director comes in for one episode. So they don't have a ton of backstory about character, et cetera. They're just like trying to keep the train on the track and shoot it fast enough. And um, so in this show in particular, more than a few times, the director has come up to me and given me a direction where they don't understand that this girl is very specifically a weirdo and she's doing different things in almost every episode. She's trying different things on different people. People were very confused as to what I was doing, but I was like, she just hasn't played dumb and nice before. So she's just trying that, you know? Um, The thing that they let me say in that scene, which was not on the page was, um, you want to cuff me? (laughs) Did that make it to air? It did make it to air. I could talk to you about all of this all day long. I am going to let you go and say thank you for joining us for Lady Night. Congratulations on Big Sky and everything you've accomplished so far. I cannot wait to see more. Dude, thank you. I appreciate it. We're having fun. Bye.